Welcome to the National Park College podcast, Common Nighthawks. My name is Wade Durden, and I hope to provide you, the listener, with an opportunity to get to know the amazing people here at, that make up the college through a series of short introductory interviews. So today, our first guest is historian Dr. Christopher Thrasher, and we're going to jump right into this. So, Dr. Thrasher, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in a little town in northern Alabama, just barely across the Tennessee state line. Uh, my parents were school teachers, so of course that meant there was no way I was going to spend one moment in school any longer than I had to. I certainly was not going to go to college, and if I somehow tripped up and went to college, I was never going to be involved in education because that's, <laughs> that just seemed like a terrible thing to do. Uh, so I went to welding school. I was a, a welder. I did construction, did a couple other things, and life was good. Uh, and then I met a, a college girl who said that I was wasting my life, and if I didn't go to college, <laughs> she was going to refuse to ever see me again. And uh, I still knew that college and school was terrible, but I wasn't ready to be done with college girl yet. So I went to a little community college, like National Park, and I loved it because it was nothing like high school. It wasn't restrictive. It wasn't, right. it wasn't, I wasn't micromanaged. I worked with really smart, interesting people that love their subjects and they love teaching. And college girl is long gone, but now I have a PhD and I'm a history <laughs> professor. So, you know. I'm just curious, what school was it? Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, Calhoun Community College in North Alabama. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't think I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's not much to hear of. <laughs> I'm probably their most famous alumni, which is, <laughs> which is sad. But it was a nice little school, like like National Park, and it was, right. it was a good it was a good starting place for me. How long were you a welder? Uh, let's see. Well, I did it all through high school, okay. um, and so I started because I figured out because I hated school so much. When I went to ninth grade, they had this vocational program, and so if you did if you got in the vocational program, which I didn't want to go. I mean, I wanted to do something blue collar anyway. Uh, they let you leave school after lunch, right. ching and then I could go work in a welding shop and do something other than sit, which I always liked to read, and I was always, uh, you know, very interested in, in learning. I just hated the classroom environment, and I would rather, I wanted to do things, um, and so, yeah, I started doing it in ninth grade, um, and then I guess I probably graduated high school, and I probably put down the welding torch for the last time when I was, I was probably 19 or 20, not long after I was out of high school. What did your parents think about that choice? Um, you don't have to answer no, that. No, 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 I mean, I, I'm no, 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 I'm perfectly happy. Um, I, I don't know that they cared, uh, really. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they were, they were, if I had just said, I'm going to drop out of school, I think we would have said, you're an idiot. That's, that's terrible. But uh, my grandfather, uh, was a, an air conditioning guy. Mm -hmm. I had an uncle who did factory work, who was a machinist. I mean, so the idea that, okay, I'm going to be this this kind of blue collar tradesman, this kind of skilled worker. I think they saw that. And a lot of the guys that we went to church with were these blue collar guys that had skilled trades and were very smart and made a lot more money than my parents as teachers. <laughs> uh, and I think, I think they, they thought that was, that was fine. It didn't terribly. It's one of the few good decisions they made as parents is they didn't, they didn't try to stomp that on its head. They kind of just rolled <laughs> with it. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. So now you have a PhD in history. I do. And, you're here. So how did you come to uh, be at National Park College? Um, I was fired um, from Calhoun Community College, funny enough, the same uh, one that I attended. I, I don't think I knew that when yeah. we interviewed you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, got, I got fired. Uh, so what happened was I'd been at a couple other schools, and I ended up finally, you know, I get to come home. I get to come home to Calhoun Community College, the place where I started. Uh, and it was fantastic. And honestly, it was, it was a pretty good experience. But then... I found out why it is that Alabama consistently ranks 49th or 50th in education. Uh, they went through some budget cutbacks, and they said, hmm, how can we save money? You know, it's really expensive. Faculty, faculty, full-time faculty are real expensive. Uh, who in social sciences have we hired recently? Oh, yeah, new guy. New guy. Best of luck, new guy. We love you. We'll recommend you. We'll, we'll sing your praises because right. you're great. Yeah. But... Um, you are the uh, you are the answer to our math problem, and if we replace you with a couple of adjuncts, That's so and we do this in all of our divisions across the board, then all of our money problems are solved. Right. So I became the answer to a math problem. So yeah, I got. I mean, I say fired is probably more correct because I got laid off. But right. Yeah, we love you, but have a nice life. So um, 
what or who has had the biggest influence on who you have become and why? Um, Abraham Lincoln once said, everything I am or hope to be, I owe to my sweet angel mother. And I know it's cliche, <laughs> but I'll say it. Uh, so what happened was my, my parents were school teachers and my mother had been teaching just a few years when I was born. I was the, the first child. And so she wanted to be the good, dutiful mother, gave up her job and went home uh, to, to, be, to be my mother. Um, which I appreciate immensely. And the thing was, she was this young school teacher that was still just just chomping at the bit to be a teacher. And she learned so much, and she was so excited to be a teacher, and she had no one to teach except me. Mm. So I became her hobby. Right. And so she poured all of the enthusiasm and love of teaching and love of education that really should have been distributed to 30 or 40 students to me, because it was just her and I for the first four years, and my dad, who was gone all day. And so by the time my brother, John, uh, was born when I was four years old, uh, I went off to preschool knowing how to read, knowing how to do most things right. at kindergarten or first grade level because she had nothing better to do. And I became her hobby. I became her, you know, her amusement, you know, her outlet, professional outlet. Uh, and then what happened was I, ended up, I got a brother and then I got two sisters in short, uh, short sequence after that. Um, and then that house, which had been quiet and peaceful and wonderful, became filled with screaming children and barking dogs and yeah um and books she taught me to read i mean that was more than anything what what mattered and that became my place of refuge i could take a book and i could go out in the yard or i could find some quiet space or i can go in the library where people aren't allowed to talk and i could have peace and i could have quiet and i could and i could read so yeah i don't i don't think that was her intention i mean i love my mother she's a wonderful woman but frankly i think it was more due to the fact that she was bored than anything and she laughs and says that and she says yeah you know poor christopher he got the he got the brunt of all of my uh, you know four years of, of education degree you yeah. know just kind of you know inserted upon him right um, and you get to the last one and you're sort of like Oh, that'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I think that's really what. I mean, about yeah. By the time she had the fourth one, she was not bored. She was, you know, trying desperately not to kill us all. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Which I yeah. mean, you know, I, I have four kids. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. My my dad used to say he'd get mad at me. I was a difficult child a lot of times, and you know, he would say, you know, you 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 watch out. You're going to have a son one day just as just as awful as you. Well, jokes on you, old man. I ain't having no kids. Um, <laughs> I am not. <laughs> I'm happily married, and we have zero children, and it is a beautiful thing. I mean, it's great. People are keeping the species alive, but um, yeah, it's not, not me. Thing. Not my thing. Not not my place in the world. That's all right. So I want to uh, back up. I'm curious. Um, what led you to history? You know, I'm a historian too. I have. That was my initial track to study. I remember my uh, my mother once again taught me to read at a very young age, and then you know the point at which she taught me to read a little, she kind of unleashed me. She would take me to the local library and you know basically say, pick something out, find something. And I loved literature. I love good stories. And I may I, I say I'm going to go back and get a master's degree in American literature or something. Maybe maybe my next life I'll be a literature professor. And I and I love a good story. And then I also read some kind of science stuff and all that, and I love factual information. The thing I love about history was for this, this young boy that just wanted to devour and just wanted, just wanted everything, just this insatiable thirst for knowledge. History is fantastic because it's a two-for-one special because you get great stories, mm -hmm. but it's stuff that really happened. Really happened. You're actually getting – I mean, in literature, it's wonderful. I love a great work of literature, but it, it, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But history really happened, and the stories in history, I think, are – often just as good or often better than what you find in literature, but they really happen and they give you real insights into who people are and into how the world works and to why things are the way they are and why we're having this conversation in English and why I'm wearing trousers mm -hmm. and not a kilt and, you know, any number of, I mean, just anything, you know, right. why, why is this thing on my wrist, you know, why is this, this, this Fitbit there, all these things. Uh, you know, why are we in this situation, uh, you know, in 2019 we have men and women sitting at the same table Whereas, you know, previous generations, we wouldn't have, I mean, you know, how, yeah. how do you explain that? How do I explain things that I, that happen to me and that I interact with every single day? History is the answer to that. So, yeah, that's why I picked history. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's yeah. a good way of looking at it. Um, tell me about an experience that you have had here at the college that you believe others would enjoy or that others may want to remember. Um, yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about one of the, one of the stupidest things I've ever done, but also one of the things that I think, I think has turned out pretty well with a little modification. So, so when I came here, you know, I'm this new history guy and, 
you know, I very much sold myself as this energetic guy and I'm going to make changes and you know, I'll make improvements and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, the, you all had been doing a, a Constitution Day event mm-hmm. for a number of years. And they came to me and they said, you know, we've done this event. It's always been a good event, but we feel like we could do a better job of reaching out to students. We feel like we could do more to get students excited and engaged and, and get them to to really get into this very important thing. And so a group of us got together and met, and I think you may have even been part of this conversation. I, I don't remember, honestly. It's been a couple of years. Uh, and what we eventually came up with was we, we went to history for inspiration. And so, of course, you as a historian know this, but people listening may not. Uh, whenever the Constitution was originally written, uh, you know, you had to go through this ratification process. And so they sent it out and said, okay, you know, you people debate. You, you know, each, each colony or each state by that time had to decide if they were going to ratify or not. Uh, and so they had public debates. And they would have somebody or a team that said, no, this is a terrible idea. You'd have somebody else say, oh, it's a great idea. We should do this. And in an era before YouTube and Netflix and uh, you know, television or even radio, this was, this was entertaining. This was, this was something you wanted to go out and watch. And so what would happen is they'd have these debates, and they often were, were just very rambunctious affairs. You know, the, the guys, and it was always guys, of course, uh, would, would insult each other. The, 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 the crowd would yell back and forth. I mean, people think that political discourse now, I hear this all the time, oh, political discourse has gotten so terrible. We're so mean to each other. And we're, I mean, don't get me wrong, we're bad. I would like to see us do better. But the things going on in modern political life, I mean, go back to the 1700s and tell me those people didn't insult each other. Yeah. Tell me they didn't get really <laughs> ugly because uh, they yeah. absolutely did. Uh, and so they have just these rambunctious, racious, rowdy affairs. And then at the end, uh, in many cases, people would get like rotten fruit thrown at right. them or they would take them out. They would dunk them in the, in the local pond or whatever else. I said, so, so we said, let's do that. Let's do that. So let's have a debate. And let's make it fun, certainly make it factual, but make it a lot of fun and make it not just talking about history, but actually kind of reenacting history to some degree. Give them a sense, not just of what it sounded like, but kind of what it felt like to be in that crowd. Uh, And so Dr. Argo generously agreed to argue in favor of ratification. (laughs) I argued against it. Um, We had our debate. Uh, I think Argo failed to appreciate what he was walking into because he he actually... certainly did. Yeah, I mean, you, you were there. Uh, he, you know, he tried to be intelligent and make good points, and I basically channeled my inner Hulk Hogan and said ugly things about his parents. He sure did. I mean, I really, I really just gave him a hard time. Um, and Argo's way smarter than me, but when it comes to revving up an angry crowd, I'm your man. I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can stir up a hornet's nest of rednecks um, with the best of them, and I did. And so, I think I was about thirty seconds away from getting getting them to actually murder Argo, um, and they stopped it at that point. And then we decided, we decided ahead of time, that we would let the crowd determine the winner. Uh, in true democratic, little d, democratic uh, process, we had a vote, and we decided who won and who lost the debate. Well, of course, Argo was right and made way better points, but I had won over the crowd, uh, and I think that's a lot of times how these debates went in the yeah, 1700s. Yeah. It was yeah. more who could stir people up and who could be a demagogue, which which I was pretty good at. Uh, and so Argo, Argo lost um, because he, he had no idea what he was getting into and just, just totally misread the crowd. And it was time for punishment. And I generously agreed that I would also accept the punishment, which was always the plan. Um, and so we went to, to get our punishment. And we had decided, hey, okay, what, what would be a great punishment? We said, you know what's really hilarious, like Three Stooges, a pie in the face. I mean, what's funnier than a pie oh, yeah. in the face? Yeah. And that seemed like a great idea up until the moment we walked over to the place to receive our punishment. And we went to that table where people had taken uh, paper plates and had smeared them with, like, a generic ready whip that had been sitting out in the sun for a couple hours at this point <laughs> on a hot August, or I forget what month it was, a hot Arkansas day. It's September. September, thank yep. you. I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember the date. Uh, so yeah, it's the, the the very tail end of the of the summer there, getting into fall, and it was hot. It was a hot day, mm-hmm. and as soon as I started walking that way, I, I caught that smell. And if you have never smelled. <laughs> rancid, generic, <laughs> knockoff Cool Whip that's been sitting in the sun, you don't want to. And so we walked over there. I was a good sport, decided to go with it. And so people took turns coming up, and they had, I, free, I think Sam Christian deserves the blame on this. I think she was in charge of setting up the, the destruction. And so there right. was just, 
they seemed like those pies were never going to end. I mean, people just came up just one after the other, just in my in our hair, yes. in our ears, nose, <laughs> just everywhere. Um, it was just just absolutely horrific. Uh, and then it was bad for me. Now, thankfully, I lived just a few minutes from campus, so I was able to kind of wipe off a little. Well, poor Chuck Argo, he lives in Little Rock, which is like an hour and a half away. So he had to spend an hour and a half in his nice new car driving, trying really hard to, <laughs> to look through, you know, his eyes, which were stinging from the from the uh, uh, the horrible, horrible stuff that had gotten in his face, and had to drive uh, drive all the way home. Um, so I think the good that came out of that was it was actually a pretty good event, and we've replicated it every year. Um, so we've done it now three times, and I think I think the crowd gets bigger, and I think it becomes a a more fun event every time. And I think it actually has a real educational purpose because even though we kind of, we're silly and we throw insults in, uh, we do a really good job of actually sticking to what the debate was at its core. You know, well, actually, even me, you know, being ridiculous, you know, I make a valid point and then say something ugly about his cousin. Um, right. And it's, you know, it's, it's goofy like that. Uh, and then it gives people, I think, a real feel for, for kind of how those debates worked. The stupid part was pies. Yeah. I will, and I said at the time, I will never, ever do this again. I will never, ever willingly let somebody hit me with a pie, particularly <laughs> not one that's been sitting out in the sun. That was really, really stupid. Uh, but so now we do water balloons. Oh, and, I, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah we that's do a lot balloons. better. Water balloons are a lot better. Yeah. Um, and I won the first two years. The third year, I lost. I made a mistake. We got students involved, which I think is always great to get students involved. We got Alan Robinette involved. And Alan Robinette... That dirty, good for nothing, beat me at my own game guy. <laughs> uh, what he did, he was on Argo's team, uh, and he went. He, he of course works in our library. He's a, a librarian now at uh, at Henderson State University. Uh, just got a full time job over there. Uh, he got a list of 18th century insults, and he passed it out <laughs> to all of his to all of the people on his team. And I'm pretty good at revving up a crowd, but I'm telling you. Those 18th century insults were, I mean, it was, I brought a knife to a gunfight. I mean, he really just, I mean, it's hard to beat anybody that's arguing with you and at the end calls you a spittle-addled baboon. Or, I mean, what, I mean, just, any, I mean, just goofy things he was calling me. Um, and I lost. So we, we lost last year, but I'm, I'm digging up my own insults for next year. So, yeah, that. I think, and hopefully that's something we keep doing, uh, and maybe even eventually we'll we'll pass the torch, and Argo and I will have other people stand in and kind of take the lead. Maybe you want to do it next oh, year. Oh no, I've done it. <laughs> when I was at Flasky Tech, we did a very similar thing, uh, except we had to dress in actual garb, from oh, like revolutionary garb with the mm. wigs and the whole thing. They rented the whole circus. There's pictures of me somewhere. <laughs> I, I I have I hope I never find them again. <laughs> But yeah, and I I was more of the Argo, yeah, very straight. Yeah, we yeah. had it scripted, and yeah. my my colleague went off script and started <laughs> insulting, and I, I I was like, that's not on the script. <laughs> so you know, yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny. That's a good story. I remember that very yeah. well. Okay, so I want to do a little lightning round with okay, you. Okay, great. Do a lightning round. Uh, quick answers, although sure. I reserve the right to delve further. Of course, of those. course, of course. Okay, so first question, what's your favorite book? I have so many. If I had to pick one, um, I will say uh, Hell's Angel, Strange and Terrible Saga by Hunter S. Thompson. Oh, my goodness. That's, have you read it? I have not. I mean, I've, I, it's one of those books that someday I probably will pick up. But that's interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. But. I love it, and I love things that hit kind of multiple objectives or kind of hit multiple things. I love it because it's actually a great history of the 1960s by a guy that was there in the middle of it, and it's a first-person account. Uh, and then I also love it because Hunter S. Thompson may be just the greatest writer in American history. I mean, he is just a phenomenal writer. He has a, a certain style that I think is just, just very unique and very descriptive and, and very evocative of emotions. Um, so, yeah, that would, I mean, I could name a hundred others probably. But, right, right. But, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good one to, to name. Okay, what's your favorite song? Um, I mean, once again, so many. I'll tell you one that I've been listening to gone back and listened to a bunch lately, is uh, Old Crow Medicine Show, um, Ain't It Enough, mm -hmm. which is, yeah. a, is a wonderful song about, you know, finding contentment and just taking joy in little things, and, you know, it isn't, isn't this enough, and that's something I, you know, have moments I get frustrated or I get irritated about something, you know, I try to remember 
I've got a good life and isn't isn't that right. enough? Right. And that's a great message. I like that. Yeah, that's an interesting band. They stood outside the uh, uh, Grand Ole Opry for a couple of weeks playing their stuff on the corner until they were finally invited in. Really? Yeah. Did not know that. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite food? Uh, favorite food? It's you know, not pie in the face. Not pie sure. in the face. No, no. I, you know, it's funny. I don't really love pie. To this day, and I, I know it's all in my head, I feel like if the sun is hot enough and the wind blows just right, I feel like that smell is still in my hair. I, I, I know that's a hallucination, but I, I feel that way. So yeah, I don't. Funny enough, I don't really. I mean, I ate plenty of other things, but I don't really eat pie. Uh, no, I tell you that, and I've lived in six states, and I've probably visited forty, and I love barbecue, and I think, and nobody's paying me to say this, uh, nobody would pay me to say this, uh, but I think the ribs that's smoking in style. Are just those are really good. They are really good ribs. Yeah. I could, yeah. I, that would, yeah. That's my favorite. Okay, so what brings you the most joy in your daily life? Um, I mean, I think one of the things I've gotten better about as I've gotten older is just to take joy in in little things. Uh, you know, I love getting up in the morning and having that first cup of coffee and having that that bitter and sweetness and that warmth on you know on my tongue. I, I love. I love when I get a good parking space at the store. Uh, I love I love a good meal. I love I love going home and having my puppy dogs jump up on me and want to get petted. Uh, you know, I love that I can come home and I can talk to my wife and we can you know we can we don't have kids and we can spend time just talking and relaxing and you know I think it's I think it's just those. I love being in the office and here on campus and hearing people you know laughing down the hall and knowing I work with good people who enjoy what they do and just. Even not knowing what they're laughing about, maybe laughing about me. I don't know. Maybe I'm the butt of all the jokes, and that's fine if I am. <laughs> um, it's 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 really nice just kind of being in that. And so yeah, I think yeah, I think just the little little things. I've I've gotten better and better about taking taking joy and taking joy in. That's good. That yeah. that'll help you live longer. Yeah. Uh, if you could have dinner with one historical figure, who would it be? I mean, once again, as a historian, how do you how do you begin to answer? That? I know. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you who I probably would pick. Um, I probably would pick Davy Crockett. Oh, neat. And I'll, t- and I'll tell you why. Uh, because, you know, he's this, and I grew up watching the, the old uh, Disney series with Fess Parker, you know, and I, I got mm-hmm. a, a oh, polyester yeah. coonskin cap, and, you know, that was that was me at a, at a very young age. I'm sure there's plenty of embarrassing pictures of me out there, my polyester <laughs> coonskin cap and my thick glasses and my bare feet running around the backyard thinking I was Davy Crockett. But then as you... You know, as you read things as a historian and you get more scholarly, you realize the man was just an absolute fraud. I mean, he just lied relentlessly. His his autobiography is a horrific work of fiction in which he took credit for every <laughs> wonderful thing that he ever heard of that clearly wasn't him. I mean, he was just yeah. he was a congressman and, and a terrible congressman. I mean, just mm-hmm. didn't, didn't do anything. Basically spent all his time laying around getting drunk, from what I can tell. Um, but there's part of me that really wants to like him. And so I don't know if you've seen the uh, the Alamo movie with um, Billy Bob Thornton. I have not seen that. It's, a, it's actually a really well yeah. done movie. And the, the thing that I love about the depiction uh, in in that movie is it shows Crockett being kind of this scam artist, kind of being this mm-hmm. this this ne'er do well. But then at the end, you know, he's built up this reputation as being this this great American hero, and he's kind of been able to even people in in the Alamo, he's been able to kind of fake them out and pretend that he's. He's really this this heroic figure, uh, and he is just about the point of having to, uh, you know, he's going to have to decide if he's going to if he's going to go down swinging or if he's just going to you know get down on his hands and knees and cry and beg. And he sees this little boy out of the corner of his eye. He's just about to just throw down his gun. He's about to say it's you know it, you know it's all a mistake. It's all a fraud. I'm a, and he sees that kid and he kind of grits his teeth. He says, "Well, I guess I got to be Davy Crockett now." Mm. And I would just love to know. I, w- I would love to think that, that they kind of got him right. Yeah. That he was, he yeah, he was a fraud. But then it is, it is core. He actually was that guy. Right. Um, so yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to kind of get my personal estimation. Was he, was he just a, a worthless scam artist and fraud, or was he a good guy at heart who kind of, you know, played things up a little and tried to, tried to do a little self promotion and. Right. I don't know. I'd be that's more curious. interesting. I, I would have not. Pick Davy Crockett, but that's yeah. because I've probably not paid as much attention to him. Yeah, he's, he's that's an interesting, interesting one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one last question, and sure. this might come with require some preface 
for me, yeah. but when it comes to helping others, are you a gardener in the sense that you help them grow or a carpenter in the sense that you try to mold them? You know, I think that that's probably a better question for, for, for people other than myself, because I can, I can think I am whatever I think I uh -huh. am. You know, I can be Davy Crockett thinking that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the king of the wild that, frontier. Okay. But, 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 I mean, it's just you happen to have two students here who work with me. Oh, so, Abby, <laughs> Abby, what do you think? Is he a gardener or a carpenter? I mean, would it be cheating to say both? Not if you explain your answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think you do do a bit of both. Because, okay. I mean, especially my experience with you, I mean, I've changed a lot as a student working with you. And I think that's both due to you putting ideas in my head and both to you pushing me to do things. Right. <laughs> that's, that's good. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, come on, lay it on me. What do you got? Um, Throw the um, water balloon. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, I do kind of agree with Abby. It is both. I think more along the lines of a gardener. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, like you were saying, like you are kind of like planting those seeds of ideas. But you're also not like, do this and do that. And this is going to help. Like You're kind of like, if you want to, I think I could recommend you to do this. And that might be your best bet. But you're not actively like, you're going to do this because that's going to get you successful. You're just kind of like... You go your own pace. I'll help you along the way if I can. So I should explain the the uh, inspiration for that question. It's because my now ten year old daughter last year. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I asked her to do something. She said, "Dad, stop being a carpenter. Be a gardener <laughs> like mom." And I went, "Oh my gosh, I'm a carpenter." <laughs> <laughs> so I just was curious how you know yeah, that would come yeah. out. So we have a couple of students with us today, uh, Abby Hanks and Miriam Baldwin, who are sort of doing the editorial and production of this podcast. We're going to let uh, the two of them ask you some questions. Um, I know there are people, you know, there's people you just don't like. There's people that you may not want to be around them. Has there ever been... <laughs> Has there ever been a student, maybe in class, not naming names, not making anything, oh. but just kind of where you're like, I want you to drop out of my class, please, just silently begging them to? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. We're just going to start with trash and students. We'll just, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll just go right for we it. We probably shouldn't mention names. No, 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 no. I definitely, <laughs> I definitely, as, won't, mention, I definitely won't mention names. Um, I'll tell you one thing. This may, maybe we frame this in a positive way. Maybe we think about, you know, for students that are listening to this, you know, what do I do to, to not annoy people that are trying to help me? What do I do to, you know, to, to not antagonize somebody who potentially could be an ally? I think the, the biggest thing that, that kind of, and I hate to say annoys, but the biggest thing that, that kind of frustrates me is Students that sign up for class and then just don't do anything, you know, if why are you here? You know, students that comes in, they put in the earbuds, they ignore me, they they fail the test, they they don't do any work, they don't turn anything, and it's you know, why are you here? Why are you signing up for the class? Why are you even like I, I want to teach and I want to help you and I want to work with you and I want to find ways to speak to your interest. Why are you here and? Why, if, if, if this is what you want, if you're not interested in anything I have to say, if you're not interested in doing any of the work, why are you here? Um, I, I could second that. Yeah. As being in the classroom for all the years I was. So, yeah. 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 You mentioned how when you were growing up, you preferred doing things rather than Absolutely. being in a classroom. Sure. So how do you feel like, or do you feel like you incorporate that into your own classes? Yeah, I think I think I do. Once again, you've you've been in class with me, so maybe you can tell me if I'm succeeding or failing at this. I think the fact that my classes are are very interactive. I think the cl fact that I go in, I have this this very this very odd style where I go in the first day and I basically tell everybody who I am and I say, okay, what do you want to cover? What are you interested in? What what do you want to do? What do you want to skip? What what do you feel like you've already heard a thousand times? Uh, the reason I do that is because when I got ready to teach for the first time, I realized how completely out of my depth I was, and I had no clue what to do, and I had no <laughs> clue what to, So I went in, I did something I tried really hard not to do. I, I went in, I just told them the truth, and I just said, okay, I'm, I should not be here. I'm, I'm completely <laughs> out of my depth, but we're kind of in this together, so help me out, and I'll help you out. Uh, and at this point, I feel like I, I do kind of know what I'm doing, but I continue to do that because I appreciate that interaction. 
Um, and I think when we think about what does it mean to do history, well, doing history means uh, that you have to do your own research. It means that you have to think for yourself about what you what you what you think. Uh, it means that you have to be able to articulate that. You have to be able to articulate it verbally. You have to be able to write it coherently. And so, yeah, I think to the extent, you know, doing history, obviously doing history is very different than doing welding, but to the extent that you can do history, researching, thinking, writing, coming to your own determination about things. And I get, have students get frustrated and they say, well, you know, what, what's the right answer? Well, there's not one. There's, there's not. I mean, you can, there's, there's a variety of options here. I'm like, what do you mean to say? I'm like, I want you to tell me what you think. Well, I don't know what I, well, I want you to figure that out because I think that's doing history. So, You've had me in class more than once, to your eternal sorrow, perhaps. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you make a good argument. I mean, yeah. I definitely do think your classes are interactive. Yeah. And I think I think you have a really good balance of having both interaction and both having kind of like that lecture style. Yeah. So I know there are students who prefer one or the other. Mm -hmm. Like sure. I prefer the lecture style, but I definitely still enjoy the interactiveness mm -hmm. of it. And, and even take it a step further, you know, about doing history, you know. The step beyond, you get beyond the classroom, doing history means going and working for the National Park Service and working in the archives or working or working in the uh, the historical society and actually working with documents or things like that. And so when I have students, and both of y'all are great examples of this, that I feel are ready and eager to do history at a greater, higher level than just being in the classroom, you know, I'm, I'm constantly recruiting for the historical society. I'm recruiting for the National Park. I'm recruiting for... Uh, for people that uh, that want a research assistant to help them with a great project and make a you know kind of a social science podcast right. kind of thing. So yeah, I think I think I think what y'all are doing right now is you're doing history. Dr. Durden, one last question for you before we wrap up. I know you've been both an educator and now you're an administrator. How do you feel that being an educator helped you in the administrative position? Yeah, you know, this is this is something I struggle with because I taught for 15 years before I became an administrator. And um, when I became vice president, I had a very difficult time. And I still struggle with it, not being around students. I, there are probably, and I hate to admit this, 10 students on campus who I know their names at this point because I'm so distanced from the classroom. And that's a real hard thing for me. And so I struggled with... Um, that a lot but at some point my wife who's very sage-like says you know you're still a teacher it's just you have a different group of students and you have a different subject matter you're teaching because right now you know I, I I I have to teach faculty and sometimes other administrators these are the rules this is what we have to do this is the and and so I try to I try to keep myself anchored by thinking of myself as a teacher, just a subject matter expert in a different way. And, um, but, I, it's, but I don't think I would have been as good of an administrator if I had not been a teacher. In fact, when uh, younger people who uh, I mentor who are coming up through the ranks ask me what they need to do, you know, what do I need to do to take the next step to move into a director position or whatever, and I tell them, you need to go teach class. That's what you need to do, you're working on a campus. You need to teach. And if you're not teaching, you're never going to go much further than you are right now. And so that's always my advice. Yeah, we were, uh, I was talking to Annie Benoy not terribly long ago, and she was talking about your, with your advice. She wanted to, she's mm -hmm. been over I, the administrative side and wants to teach. And so I think we've got a, we, we were talking over the social science, so I think she's going to teach the, uh, the college seminar class, that's right. which I think is a perfect fit for her and, and kind of, tailored to her expertise. So I, I think that is great advice. And as a teacher, um, I, I agree 100%. And I think I think that's good advice. And I hope you keep giving it. And and I don't know, I mean, Annie has her own career trajectory, and that's great. Um, I don't know that she needs to be, you know, a full-time instructor. No. All, but I think teaching a class or two and, right. and getting a little feel for how a classroom works, particularly when you can teach something that's in your area of expertise, not, you know, learning a whole new skill set, but you have so much experience over with administration, over student services, and she can share a lot of that with students. I think I think that's great. If I if I had my way, I mean, if I was emperor, which I never will be, you know, I'd I'd have every and I know this is impractical, maybe uh, I'd have every administrator teaching at least at least a class a year. Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing I love about Dr. Hogan is he taught that honors 
uh, seminar in leadership, and That's he's right. even said he would do it again. That's right. It was very beneficial for him. It was, and he said that. He said he, he really got a lot out of that. I think it helped him connect with our students. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm appreciative that uh, that you're encouraging people to teach. I'm appreciative, appreciative that Hogan is actually teaching. Hopefully at some point we'll get you to do at least, a, at least an honor seminar. I know. So, I need to get back in there. I've yeah. been saying that for a couple of years now. Yeah. Well, very good. Um, as we close today, uh, I just want to say thanks, Dr. Thrasher, for participating and helping me start this project. Also, a uh, special thanks to Abby Hanks and Miriam Baldwin for technical and editorial support. Students like these make this kind of project possible. Uh, the college is here to create opportunities for students like Abby and Miriam to learn skills like these so they can apply them in the real world. And producing a podcast is pretty cool. Um, hopefully these skills will contribute you know, to long and successful careers in whatever you do. So, uh, Finally, uh, I just want to say, remember you don't just come to the college, go out to be the college. So thanks for listening and be good and do good.